Before we begin, I would like to thank all of my patrons, including the patrons of the Cryptid Commune, who are as follows. Dan Curry, Alex Harris, Christina Yenny, Lily Marks, Brandon Ray, Nick Padula, and Mackenzie and Peach Schweikert. Thank you all so much, and please enjoy. Your name is David. You're a boy who loves your mother very, very much. Unfortunately, it seems your mother only loves real boys, and you are just a mecha. Your creator says you're the first mecha that's been programmed to feel love. This also means that you're the first mecha to experience heartbreak. There's hope, though. You overheard your mother reading the story of Pinocchio to her real son. Pinocchio is a puppet who gets magically transformed into a real boy when he meets the blue fairy. If you can find this blue fairy, then you'll be real too, and you'll finally be deserving of your mother's love. You will spend what precious life you've been given searching for this blue fairy. Eventually, you will find her deep beneath the ocean's waves. That is where you'll ask her, please, please make me into a real, live boy. You'll spend an eternity down there, repeating your request over and over again, but the blue fairy will never answer your prayer. The seas will freeze over, entire species will dwindle to nothing. You will have left behind everything you love to chase something you already have. It will never occur to you that you were real all along. Your name is Sylvia Schweigert. You've always thought that the question, are androids real, was boring from an intellectual perspective. Of course androids are real, you think. It's arrogant to assume that our meek computers are any different from their computers. However, you've always found that the question was emotionally captivating. For you, the question might as well be, am I real? Logically, you know that you're a real person and a real woman. There is no argument, no legislation, no act of violence strong enough to eliminate what is real within you. Yet you don't feel real. What exactly does real even feel like? Prior to transitioning, you often felt like a non-person. You'd allow anything to happen to you, whether you liked it or not, because only real people get to have wants and needs. You were just a shell. Your mechanical body simply ran through the motions. Transitioning imbued this automaton with a soul. You finally believe in your own personhood, and now, after all that progress, you've started to get a a wild idea into your head. For some inexplicable reason, you want to start calling yourself an it. Yeah, that's right, you want to start using it pronouns. Given your past struggles with personhood, do you really, do, do you really think that that's a good idea? You'd be referring to yourself the same way you refer to an electrical appliance or an animal. What if you bring those buried feelings back? Besides, no one is going to understand you. You spent so much time trying to get your cis family and friends to understand, and now you're gonna throw that away? You become just another story for someone else to tell. Oh, so I know this trans person named Sylvia, and their pronouns are she, it. It? Can you believe that? Isn't that just fucking bananas? <laughs> The jokes would practically write themselves, oh, she's a piece of shit. You know some people who would love that one. Similarly, there are transphobes who would jump at the chance to be able to call you an it without any fear of repercussions. After all, they'd be respecting your pronouns. Ironically, the people who love you are much less eager to respect these particular pronouns. They've been undyingly supportive of everything you've done, including every aspect of your transition, yet they falter when it comes to calling you an id. If you only came to your senses, you'd see how right they are. How could you force them to use such a harmful word for you? They promise to always protect you and keep you safe. It is the word that the bad people use to hurt you. He recently read Young Man, The Selected Diaries of Lou Sullivan. There's one entry where Sullivan, a trans man, 
accompanies a drag queen on her way to the bar. Some teenage boys watched us walking and began shouting. When I left her at the bar door and kissed her goodbye, they began shouting, Ugh, you kissed it. I just laughed. If only they knew. This entry was written sometime between 1977 and 1981. It's just one small example of how cisgenders have a history of using it against us. As soon as we step out of line, they start referring to us as if we're lesser creatures. Evidently, our personhood's dependent on how well we play by their rules. Dehumanizing language like this is more than just psychologically damaging. It can also serve as a precursor to violence. It may be hard to hurt a he, they, or a she, but it's much easier to hurt an it. There's a scene in Blade Runner where Deckard, our protagonist, finds out that a woman named Rachel is a replicant. His first instinct is to refer to her as she, since she passes as a female human being. However, after he's absolutely sure that she's a replicant, he says, how can it not know what it is? Rachel's dual existence as both a woman and a replicant creates a tension in Deckard. Women are the things that Deckard has sex with, or more accurately, the things he pushes around until they cave into his demands. Replicants are the things that try to deceive men like him. His job as a Blade Runner is to kill these replicants. <laughs> Wait, sorry, did you say kill replicants? No, no, no. What you meant to say was he retires skin jobs. See, killing is wrong, but retiring is no more unethical than shutting off a computer. Deckard tells himself this so that he can sleep better at night, though he might need to have a few drinks first. There's another scene where Deckard's pursuing Zora, a replicant who was working as a dancer at a nightclub. When Deckard aligns the crosshairs over her heart, knowing full well that he is about to take her life, how does he quell that pesky conscience of his? He can start by telling himself that it has a lesser soul and that its pain is less than real. More importantly, it deserves to die. This is what the skin job gets for being so duplicitous. It tried to make you think that it was a real woman. This pervert was probably posing as a dancer just to get into the women's dressing room. You need to put an end to this thing before it can get anywhere near children. The hunter feels nothing as he pulls the trigger. Another living being is removed from this earth and the jury acquits the killer because murder only applies when the victim is human. You are an android. At least you were an android. The spark that once animated you has since been extinguished. You feel and perceive nothing. Your mangled body has been returned to the customer service section of Robot Aids Incorporated. They provide customers with android slaves like you. Your intended purpose was to serve as a housemaid. The couple that purchased you, the Fultons, had other plans. They tortured you to death for their own amusement. You have no way of knowing this, but your corpse is currently in a room with two men. Dr. Kessler, a scientist who works at the company, is furious because he recognizes the Fulton's violence for what it is. The company's salesman, Mr. Hample, dismisses his concerns and insists that he's being overdramatic. Abuse, is that what you said? Punish, torture, were those your words? He gestures towards you. You certainly must recognize this is not a human being. Mr. Hample tries to prove it to Kessler. He points out your fraying wires, your synthetic skin. But suddenly, he's at a loss when he sees your face. Tears, real tears, are leaking from your artificial eyes. Hample touches your wet, plastic skin, but you don't feel the sensation. You don't see the mess of emotions flitting across his face. You should be nothing more than a doll. Humans should be able to bend and twist your limbs without any remorse. Unfortunately, it seems that even a plastic doll can still feel pain. Well, Sylvia, hopefully by now we recognize the role that language has to play in dehumanization, and how that dehumanization can lead to violence. So, let's put this it business to rest, shall we? 
No, <laughs> you think to yourself. She, it still feels right to you. None of the arguments against it pronouns are persuasive enough to dissuade you. You are inescapably drawn to this aspect of your identity, and you don't know why you should have to hide it. Your pronouns might confuse cis people or make them uncomfortable, but that's completely fine by you. You don't exist to be understood. There will also be trans people who have some reservations about it, which is reasonable given the pronoun's history. It's possible that they've had their own bad experiences with the word, so you don't blame them for being a bit hesitant. At the same time, you hope that they can respect other people's identities, even if they don't fully understand them. You have little sympathy for people who refuse to use it pronouns outright. Trying to argue your way out of using someone's pronouns is honestly kind of a cis move. The most fervent critiques of it pronouns that you've seen come from the kinds of trans people that you prefer to stay away from. They're the ones who insist that there's only one way to be a real trans person. They might tell you that the blue fairy can only be found through gender dysphoria, or inside your estrogen vial, or under the surgeon's scalpel. These people are hopelessly lost and are looking for validation in the wrong places. There's a palpable aura of self-loathing practically dripping off them, which might explain why they're willing to sacrifice self-respect in favor of cis people's acceptance. They deliberately distance themselves from xenogenders and neo-pronouns like zizer, fey fair, and yes, even it its. They're basically saying to cis people, hey, don't hate us, we're the normal ones. We don't like those freaks either. They certainly won't call you an it. Their excuse is that they don't want to normalize language that's inherently dehumanizing. While it's true that language can be dehumanizing, context and intent are everything. When a transphobe calls you an it, it hurts because you know it was meant to hurt. When your friend calls you an it, you're happy because you know that means that they respect your identity. This is merely wild conjecture, but I might suggest that the problem is the countless transphobes who use it as an insult, rather than the small handful of people who get euphoria from the wrong pronouns. Hearing it pronouns from someone who means it makes you really happy, so it's a shame that most people will only use she, her for you. Regardless, you still want to include it when you tell people your pronouns. Even if it seems like a pointless gesture, you still believe that it helps communicate who you are to the world. For you, it's a reminder to people that even though you're being forced to participate in this gender nonsense, you don't do it willingly. Your presentation may be pretty feminine, but you don't feel like you have any magical gender energy inside of you. It always feels like the gender is being forced onto you from the outside. Maybe that's why you feel at home somewhere under the agender umbrella. Generally speaking, people who are agender don't feel a strong connection to any gender. Some of them even use it, its pronouns, because those are also genderless. While you might identify as some shade of agender in the future, you know that won't fix the actual problem. The problem is that as soon as a cis person sees you, they make a split-second decision. They decide whether to put you in the blue filing cabinet or the pink filing cabinet. That decision then affects the rest of their social interactions with you. Even if you are a sexless android with a neutral gender presentation, they'd still find some way to shrink you down and stuff you into their little boxes. Their eyes reduce you. You wish there were a way that you could socialize with people while still remaining utterly unknowable. Every detail they discover about you becomes another label that they can weigh you down with. They might assume that they have you all figured out, but an it like yourself resists easy categorization. You feel like a cryptid whose true form becomes more obscured the more you are observed. The less they know about you, the closer they are to unraveling your mysteries. We generally think of it as referring to something that's subhuman, but it can also refer to something that is beyond human. Just look at the noble and proud creature that is your cat. Some people have a condescending attitude towards their pets, but they are fools. You recognize that in some respects, your cat is the superior being. 
At the very least, she enjoys freedoms that you will never know. She is blissfully unaware of the human concept we call gender. She won't care what pronouns you use for her. Honestly, it's kind of weird that you call her she in the first place. She has no idea what a woman is. Animals are immune to the gender disease. By refusing to conform to gender roles, you too can have a small taste of that freedom. Trans people are often thought of these artificial pseudo-cyborgs whose augmentations are an affront to nature. And that may sound badass, but you believe that the opposite is true. Our gender nonconformity allows us to behave more in line with our natural dispositions. If anything's artificial here, it's the gender roles that have been imposed upon us. Gender is but one of many tools our society uses to exploit us. That continued subjugation is necessary to sustain its exponential growth. This ever-expanding megalopolis encroaches upon the natural world and reduces its wonders to mere resources. Sometimes it feels as if there's nowhere left for the mysteries to hide. But fear not, child of the night, for there are still undiscovered depths where you may find refuge. The harsh light of their world is unable to pierce through the dense cover of these deep woods. The only light this forest has known is the tender glow of the maternal moon. You are a she-wolf. You are neither fully wolf nor fully woman. Human blood courses through your veins like a toxin. In hopes of curing yourself of this affliction, you have set out on a quest to find the Blue Fairy. She will be able to free you from your humanity and turn you into a real wolf. Your search has brought you to the world above. Around you is an infestation of unnatural constructs. Apparently, the humans have taken this territory for themselves. They're all fast asleep now. Their dreams are trapped within those big boxes they call home. You feel a pang of longing for what once was. A wolf like you no longer belongs here. This world is only for those who can walk about in broad daylight. Once you walked among them, standing tall on your two feet, but now they look down on you as you crawl around on four paws. Usually, the cover of night keeps you safe from their hateful eyes. Tonight will be different. You are quietly making your way through the village when suddenly the silence is shattered. A deafening crack and a flash of fire immediately precede the rupturing of your front forepaw. A jet of blood sprays out of the screaming hole. All-consuming agony overwhelms you. You know that you must run, but the pain keeps you captive. Have you been shot, you wonder? Is there a hunter? Are they preparing to shoot again? A spike of adrenaline springs your body into motion. Every step brings another stab of pain, but you have to press on. You retreat back to the world below. That's right where the humans want you. They want you to cower underground like a frightened pup, and tonight they have gotten their wish. Your quest for the Blue Fairy has ended. Your wounds may hurt, but what hurts most of all is the shame. How could you let yourself get hurt like this? You knew it would all be for nothing anyway. No matter how badly you want to believe, you know that the Blue Fairy is a myth. There is nothing outside you that can make you real. There's no blue fairy or beguiling devil that you can bargain with to transform you into what you most desire. Whether you want to become a man, a woman, or a wolf, the only person who can make that happen is you. That should feel freeing. Gender is an endless cosmos that is all yours to explore. Nobody can stop you, hard as they may try, but nobody's guiding you either. Sometimes you feel hopelessly overwhelmed by the infinite possibilities. Though you may feel lost without direction in the darkness of the night, the moon will always be there to light your way home. For the past few days, home has been a small clearing hidden amidst the ancient woods. As you limp towards the clearing, you see that your mate has been waiting for you to return. Your tail begins to wag at the sight of her. It rushes up to you at once, 
Like you, it has the head and tail of a wolf, while its fur-covered frame is much more humanoid. She stands next to you on two feet as her yellow eyes go over your wounds. A frown creases her muzzle. It instructs you to lie down so that it may better address your injuries. She lies next to you on the grass and begins to lick your wounds. Pain flares up with each stroking of her tongue. A ridiculous idea pops into your head and your grimacing suddenly gives way to an impish smile. You inform your mate that actually other parts of your body need attending to. She makes a big show of rolling her eyes, but nevertheless plays along. Tremors jolt through you as you feel its mouth make its way up to your neck. The heat between you softens the boundaries of your bodies like wax, and the two of you melt into one. Feeling yourself through her fingers, you learn to love your imperfect features. Seeing herself through your eyes, she finds her beauty for the first time. You want to be present for every scratch, every kiss, every grazing of teeth, but inevitably your restless mind wanders elsewhere. It wades through the scattered fragments of a half-forgotten life. Back in that world above, your wolf heart was stifled and stuffed inside of a man's skin. The she-wolf within you was buried beneath their human ways. Once you found her again, you tried to get the humans to accept your canid heart. You remember how much you cared about being understood. Hours upon hours were spent crafting immaculate sentences, and for what? Even the most perfect of statements could never sway a human heart. You are trying to get them to accept an identity that they would never respect. Those endeavors seem so trivial now. You have to laugh. It takes its teeth away from your neck and asks what's so funny. You tell her that it's nothing important and you sincerely mean that. Everything that's truly important is right there in front of you. You feel the arms that hold you, the lips that savor you, and the syncopation between your two beating hearts. Unlike the humans, you don't have to write an entire essay just so that she'll maybe understand you. The two of you already share an understanding without words. Its claws skate lightly across the trembling skin that knows so well. You gasp despite yourself. The constraints of language fade as you give in to much more expressive sounds. There's a moan through roaming fingers, the sibilant rush of a sharp inhale, and the irrepressible howl that erupts from your quivering body. The time for words has ended.